and welcome back. This is the second episode of Heck Knows. I'm your host, Heck and I Know. In case you missed the first episode, we're here to talk about the dumb months. We're looking back at some frighteningly bad movies that have come out over the last 20 years, just in the months of January and February, aka Dumpuary. And this time around, we're going to be talking horror. So, out of the 367 Dumpuary movies that I found, 60 fit into the horror category, and like romance, the average score of these 60 movies on Rotten Tomatoes is below the average, sitting at 34%. While there are, of course, dozens of duds in this group of films, I still find this genre exciting because I can usually still have a good time watching a bad horror movie. One of my favorite things to do is to get together with some friends, put on a bad horror movie, turn it into some sort of drinking game, and get a little silly. Speaking of which, in a future series, I will go through my top drinking movies, and a majority of those are horror movies, so stay tuned for that, it's gonna be a lot of fun. But in the meantime, let's get right into it. This is what I'm looking for in a horror film. First and foremost, it's a horror movie. I mean, I wanna get spooked. Not always jump scares, but I want that uneasy feeling deep down in my gut. Now, some of that comes from creating an atmosphere, whether it's sound design or the perfect haunted house setting, atmosphere is integral to creating tension and scares. Secondly, let's talk gore. The thing about gore is that it kind of goes hand in hand with horror these days, but the way that the movies go about it is really important for me. I'd much rather watch a super scary movie with no gore than a super gory movie with no scares. That being said though, I do enjoy myself a creatively gruesome death. Third thing I'm looking for, self-awareness and originality. Horror is guilty of enabling a ton of sequels, prequels, reboots, you name it. Some good, lots bad. All I ask is if you're going to do it, at least make it fun or special in some way and not just a safe cash grab. And lastly, give me the ghouls. I want ghosts, I want demons, I want creatures that scurry across the screen, scampering around, I want skinwalkers, I want zombies, I want serial killers, I want bugs, I want monsters. Give me the ghouls. Now, before we get to the nominees and crowned champion of trash horror, I've assembled the trailer for the spooky movies of Dumpy Wear here for you. So, please enjoy, and we'll see you afterwards. Come on, we gotta get up. The ones who got off that roller coaster are still going to die.
rises. Darkness falls. Wow, spooky stuff, eh? Welcome back. I uh, hope that wasn't too spooky for you. Now, once again, I will be using the bunk bed system, uh, starting with the middle tier, aka just a regular bed with a bed ceiling. Uh, last time around, I crowned a champion of this tier, but moving forward, I will be using this portion of the show to talk about notable releases for each genre rather than just handing out an award for mediocrity. So first up in our mid-tier shoutouts we have Scream 3. This is one of those self-aware slashers that brings the violence but doesn't take itself too seriously and it's clear that everyone involved is a fan of horror movies which makes this series as a whole a really fun viewing experience. Um, I actually found that the first film Scream was clever and fun. The second one for me was just slightly too over the top but the third is a nice balance of laughs and twists and is actually underrated in my opinion here seeing as how the first two films were rated so highly. The worst thing by far about this movie though is how they let Courtney Cox have this haircut the whole time. I mean, just look at these bangs. Oh no. Yikes. Next up we have Hannibal. It's the highest box office earner of the genre here, which is why it's getting the shout out. $350 million, massive amount of money. But it's also one of the more disappointing sequels here on this list just because of how good the original Silence of the Lambs was. I do have a distinct memory of just walking down the video store aisle, turning the corner, getting spooked by the DVD cover here, so much so that it gave me nightmares. But then just imagine my disappointment when I actually watched the movie years later. Turns out there's not that much scary about it. This one's more of a thriller with a bit of horror elements to it. Also released in February was the prequel film Hannibal Rises, which, don't watch that one, definitely more of a dud. Hannibal I can give a recommendation for just because of Anthony Hopkins mostly and an unrecognizable Gary Oldman. Great job by him. Kind of a gross movie though. Third up on our shoutouts for mid-tier, we have Final Destination, both 2 and 3. Two sequels here in the Rube Goldberg horror films that are Final Destination movies. This is the type of horror movie that's best suited for just turning off your dome and just enjoying the creative and awful ways in which its characters are killed off. It's also very easy to turn these movies into drinking games, so I definitely recommend doing that. Moving on to The Crazies. This is one of the only zombie flicks from Dumpuary, and as far as zombie films go, you could do worse than this Romero remake which has some good scares and a decent plot, which is rare. Uh, just don't compare it to 28 Days Later and you'll be fine. Next up, we have The Woman in Black, aka The Boy Who Lived versus The Woman Who Didn't. I wanted to shout out this one here because I think it's one of the better haunted house type movies that we have on this list. Unlike duds such as The Boogeyman, The Messengers, or Winchester, just stick with this first one here and avoid the sequel, which of course is another dumpy worry dud. Moving on now, we're going to the top tier. This one is still an actual award for the best movie, and luckily this time we actually do have multiple nominees. First up, we have It Follows. This is a clever little spooker here. Its originality and solid performances make it a must watch for horror fans who don't mind a bit of a slow burn. Next up in our top tier nominees, we have The Witch. This one scored 90% with critics, but only 59% with audiences. And I can maybe see why a lot of people were turned off by the sort of like folkiness of this film because it isn't really your conventional horror film, but I think this movie is awesome. Uh, Robert Eggers, the director, is in such control of the atmosphere. Uh, check out The Lighthouse if you haven't seen that one. But his ability to build a world so vividly unique is just amazing to me. Um, this one definitely starts as like a slow build, but it builds towards a crazy finale and it's got one heck of a bad goat in it, let me tell you. Next up we have Get Out. This is an example of a movie where everything is just working in perfect harmony towards the same vision. And Jordan Peele directed the heck out of this one, and everyone involved on the same page. The whole cast is great, the twist plays out perfectly, and gets better the more you rewatch it. And the balancing of humor and serious racial tension is uncomfortable but in the best way possible. Lastly for the top tier nominees, we have The Invisible Man. I'm a big fan of this one. I loved how they modernized the story with a new but believable technology alluding to all kinds of relevant and problematic current events such as invasions of privacy and gaslighting. This movie has so many tense moments and is brilliantly acted by Elizabeth Moss who is just awesome in this one, and it is also just so technically impressive I can only imagine how difficult the filming and effects work were here, and it has one of the most shocking moments in it that I've seen in a movie in a long long time. Really recommend. 
So I gotta give the Top Bunk Award to Get Out Here because I think it defies the laws of the Dumpyware movie and it somehow became an event film that everyone was talking about. It even won an Academy Award and whatever that means nowadays is still impressive, especially for a horror film. Quick honorable mention here, for the following sequels, reboots, prequels that just miss out on being nominated for Biggest Dud. We have When a Stranger Calls, Friday the 13th, Texas Chainsaw 3D, Paranormal Activity 5, and Insidious 4. Sorry, you didn't quite make it. Um, you're still a dud though. Congrats on that. You did it. It's time to venture below the bunk. This is the part of the episode where we gather the courage to peek underneath our beds and see what ghoulish films are lurking underneath. Let's take a look down in the creepy basement and see which spooky stinkers are competing for the trash crown. Here are the nominees for the biggest horror dud. Darkness Falls. It's essentially a movie about the tooth fairy gone bad. This one looks and feels like a bad episode of Supernatural or The X-Files, and any potentially scary scene is just ruined by choppy editing, it's boring, and just a mess to be honest. With a large 1% on Rotten Tomatoes and Wikipedia claiming it to be one of the worst movies ever made, next up we have Alone in the Dark. So we can't talk about this movie without at least mentioning its director, Uwe Boll, who we will see again on future episodes because he has had multiple movies come out in Dampuary. But for now, let's just say he has a talent for dud making like a few others. I really like the mini review that Keith Phipps gave, warning the viewer to beware the film that confuses before it even begins, because this movie opens with several paragraphs of complete nonsense as an attempt to try and explain the plot of the film, because I guess a test screening audience said they had no idea what the heck was going on, but let me tell you that the intro text does not help at all here. It's hilarious, actually. At this point, everyone is aware of the awful track record of video game adaptations, but this one is just on another level. We got Christian Slater wearing this trench coat like he's Neo from the Matrix, and he's gallivanting around like he's supposed to be some sort of globetrotting Indiana Jones-like figure, and his outfit kind of just symbolizes how the rest of the movie just takes bits and pieces of better Hollywood movies and hashes them all together with some chaotic action scenes, some crazy heavy metal music, a bit of violence scattered throughout there, and uh, oh yeah, Tara Reid playing a scientist, which is wild. Next up for the title of Big Stud, we have the number 23. And why did they do Jim Carrey like this? And look, I like Jim Carrey. The Mask is one of those movies that I watched probably a hundred times as a kid. So when I heard that he was in one of the worst horror movies ever made, I just sort of decided to ignore its existence until of course I, it came up on my dumpy wagon list. And I, I felt compelled to watch it and see what it was all about. Just hoping that Jim Carrey could at least make it entertaining, but no, it's bad and I feel bad. The problem with this film is that it has two films going on within the film, and unfortunately Jim Carrey is miscast in both of them. That being said, I can't even imagine who could play this role differently to make the film better because the script and the tone are just all over the place. There's a noir detective film within a film portion of this movie that's shot so weirdly as well that it makes it feel like it's making fun of itself along the way. Just not, the good, not a good look. Uh, I don't know, this is a wacky one, just not good. So going back and watching a lot of these movies, it was really interesting to see how each one kind of gives away what year it was made by the phones that the characters were using. There was so much reliance on phone calls as a plot device, and there was no better examples of that than the next nominee, which is One Missed Call. Sporting the rare 0%, the egg, on Rotten Tomatoes, let me try and explain the plot for you here. So somehow there's a ghost who haunts and kills through a chain of phone messages that predict the future death of the characters being called. It doesn't make any sense. It's bogged down by bad special effects and that nonsensical plot. And maybe it doesn't deserve that 0% distinction. I'd maybe put out like a 12% and call it a day. So I'm gonna group Rings, Fantasy Island, and Brahms the Boy 2 all together here and have them represent the awful remakes and sequels of Dumpuary. Firstly, Rings used the franchise name to sell tickets, but it's nothing that the other versions haven't already done but better. Uh, Brahms the Boy 2, it took out the only thing that made the first movie at all interesting and Fantasy Island had the least likable characters I've seen in a long, long time in a movie. None of these films are scary, they're not funny, they're not really much of anything to be honest, and that's the problem with these movies here. And finally, our last nominee for the horror genre, for the biggest dud, is The Bye Bye Man. This is one that just needs a little bit more self-awareness. 
I tried to play it really straight and take it very seriously, but it's called the freaking Bye Bye Man. Come on, guys. Seriously. So, as you can see, there's some very, very worthy contenders here for the biggest dud, but there can only be one winner. And that winner is... The number 23. I think I could easily have given this award to Alone in the Dark, but the thing is, you can at least have a good time watching that one and laugh at the absurdity of it all. The number 23, you can't. It's just a mess, and any movie that makes you feel bad for its lead actor is never a good thing. So, congrats to the number 23. You get the crown. Congratulations, you did it. You did it. Well, that does it for this episode. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, once again, I'll post the complete list of horror movies in the description if you want to check them all out and let me know if you think I missed anything. Uh, we'll have a laugh on the next episode as we take a look at the comedy genre. But until then, take care. Thank you.